Welcome into the Paul Kuharski podcast. I'm Paul Kuharski of paulkuharski.com, brought to you by Zen Sports, part of the 440 Sports Network. Want to dive right in and talk to you about how training camp lied, and that's going to be the theme of this pod. We're also getting into the protection issues, which is part of that, and Thomas Odukoyu's clock. Let's get right in. The league sells hope every offseason. That's part of the beauty of the league's calendar. Teams sell hope. All but the very worst are able to pull it off. And the Titans pulled it off this offseason. It's early for them. All is not lost. uh, And I'll get into that too. But it sure seems like those of us who bought it, uh, and I'm raising my hand here, were foolish. Um, I thought they made great gains in fixing a lot of their big issues from last year with the offensive line, with preventing explosive plays, with uh, finding playmakers or polishing up the ones that they had, with game planning and play calling, with health, who thought that Mike Vrabel would be able to get enough with what they've got and who thought that the national outlets were severely underestimating the Tennessee Titans. Well, as of right now, we did some serious overestimating. This skeptic, the one you're listening to or looking at right now, is uh, somewhat ashamed, for sure. While leaving open the possibility that it's early and that things can change, I'm still unsure how much better can the Titans block up front and how much more separation can they get from slow receivers and what scheme works given those limitations. We didn't all say, Hey, this team has the potential to be good in time. We thought they'd be competitive right out of the gate. I did. And they're not. So let's run through a couple of these specific items where we missed, where I missed. And it starts, obviously, on the offensive line. Um, After Dennis Daly, we're sure they're going to find a significant upgrade at left tackle, right? It's a weak free agent market to consider. There weren't many guys, and and they weren't great. But surely there was a scouting forecast with Andre Dillard, right? There's been a failure in in a big way to develop the skills that they saw and doesn't appear to have a lot of dog in him, quite frankly. Was he simply the best body they could get who amounted to a dice roll who might land on an acceptable number? Pro football focus, I don't like to lean a lot on pro football focus. But with offensive line, where it's hard for a a, a layman to know precisely what's going on, that's, that's the one time I'll go more to pro football focus. They have him right now as the 43rd tackle. They lump right and left tackles in together. He is 71 of 72 qualified tackles in pass blocking score. Now, Donovan Smith was one of the free agents who moved, and there weren't a lot. He went from Tampa Bay to Kansas City. He's 47th overall, so he's behind Diller but he has balance between his run blocking and his pass protection. He is 22 points better than Andre Dillard as a pass protector. The draft, we go back. Peter Skaronsky, I think we all already have a sense, even though he's only played in one game, is going to be an excellent player, right? But they really don't seem to see him as a tackle. We know he's got short arms. We know there are exception to the short arm rules. Michael Roos, one of them. Um, 11 is high for a guard, though if you get yourself a 10-year guard and this would entail them re-signing a player, which they haven't done a lot, um, you know, maybe that'll that'll be good. Maybe they're going to look at him at guard. Maybe they're going to look at him at guard. I mean, at tackle. Maybe they're going to look at him at tackle not too long after he comes back from uh, – the uh, appendix um, operation that he had. I don't know that the draft options from 
from back in April feel great either, right? They missed Paris Johnson, who was drafted ahead of their spot. He's pass blocking far better. It's not run blocking as well. And Darnell Wright went ahead of them. He's 27th overall, solid. Dewan Jones, who we just saw in Cleveland, was fourth round pick. He's playing on the right side. His pass blocking scores ridiculously good, 74.3. But, uh, and that's 24th. But he's terrible. Run blocking, 36.7. And he wasn't supposed to play this year, right? He's playing because Jack Conklin suffered another terrible injury and is lost for the year. The Titans, Mike Vrabel talks a lot about blocking from the inside out. Inside pass rush gets there faster. It's closer to the quarterback. You're dealing with guys like Aaron Donald, like Jeffrey Simmons, that, who like Chris Jones, who have emerged around the league and are a big concern. But you're also dealing with guys like Miles Garrett and Hendrickson coming up this weekend who are big concerns also. Do you want the 2018 Titans line? This line allowed 47 sacks and only blocked for a little over 2,000 rushing yards. But who among you out there is not taking Taylor Lewan, Quinton Spain, Ben Jones, Josh Klein, and Jack Conklin over the current group? Andre Dillard, Peter Skaronsky, Aaron Brewer, Daniel Brunskill, and Chris Hubbard or Nicole petit Frick. I mean, that line of of Lawan and Conklin on the edges, premier tackles at, at the top of their game at that stage, it, it, it's what you want. And, and what they did back then was fill in with the guards in 2018. That's Vrabel's first year, right? Spain, you know, did all right between Lawan and Jones. Klein was a guy I struggled with, but – they survived with him between Jones and Conklin. But here you have Dillard, who needs help on the outside all the time, taking somebody out of a route. Can't take on anybody good one-on-one -on -one with Skaronsky and Brewer. Brunskill is scoring well. Hubbard's scoring well. Um, you know, and right now, Skaronsky's out. So when he gets back in, you hope, hope things get better. Because Dylan Radin's people made out to be better than he was when he came in. And um, he was better than Xavier Newman, but uh, we'll get to his scoring soon. Planning on the offensive line. John Robinson had to know in 2022 that the Titans were unlikely to be able to keep Taylor Lewan into 2023 based on cost, even if his knee rebounded and felt good, right? Even had he had a good 2022 instead of re injuring the knee in game two it would have been difficult to replace, to, to go forward with Taylor Lewan. So where was the plan heading into 2022 to have something to go forward with in 2023? Let's go back to Rustin Webster when he drafted Taylor Lewan and the team had Michael Bruce still, right? And we all said that is a ridiculous pick. It was 11 also, right? Or 12. And it turns out that's one of the best things Rustin Webster did because he saw it happen with Walter Jones in Seattle that they didn't have a sufficient replacement plan at left tackle. And he made sure that the Titans, who uh, who went from, from Brad Hopkins to Michael Roos, would have another good left tackle. Now, Taylor Lewan's career wasn't what it should have been because of the double knee injury. But when he was in his prime and playing his best, he was not just equal to Brad Hopkins and Michael Roos, but conceivably better than them. Super athletic and able to take on premier guys. I know he had his bad moments, but but one on one. Hey, Andre Dillard can't go against Miles Garrett one on one. Clearly, Robinson had no plan to replace Lawan because Robinson was busy at right tackle. So his swing tackle was, was Dennis Daly and the Titans don't have a fifth round pick next year because of the Dennis Daly trade and the draft ads in 2001 and in 2002 
were chasing the terrible Isaiah Wilson pick. So Isaiah Wilson from 2020, who immediately busted, then he had to chase that with Dylan Radins, who maybe is a, a serviceable guy in some capacity now, but didn't turn out to be the starting right tackle he needed with a second round pick in 2021, and then had to go again with a third round pick in 2022 with Nicholas Petit Frere, both right tackles. So three right tackles in a row, first round pick, second round pick, third round pick, and no left tackle with the vision of ultimately replacing the Lawan. And so they're stuck at a place where there's nobody good on the free agent market. And uh, they're not in position to get a left tackle because they decided to draft a left guard unless Skaronsky ultimately moves out there. But either way, they're at least one man short on, on the offensive line in terms of high caliber pass blocking, which leads to what we've witnessed in the last two games. Skaronsky is good. I don't think there's any question. We've only seen him in one game. He's got the pedigree, um, got the mindset. You listen to him talk. He knows, knows what he's talking about, all of that. Raidens, you know, because he replaced Newman and because he's not in that game and because he's not any of these other guys, everybody got high on. His 30.1 pass blocking rating at PFF is worse than Diller. Brewer has been okay. And Brunskill and Hubbard actually have solid sco scores. Titans should move Tannehill to, to the right, except that they've had four rollout by design all year. If you need a chip, well, Wesco been horrible. Chig seems to be flailing. And uh, I'll get more into that in a little while. Weapons. Weapons, weapons. Now, I didn't go along with the weaponry thing. Obviously, DeAndre Hopkins was a good ad and an ad they needed, and he's been helpful. But anyone was naive to think that much was going to happen here in terms of separation, which has been a problem. I thought that they would be a tight window, great route reliant team, and they are. The guys who were going to win with speed here, Tajay Spears, um, who hasn't been able to do that much in the passing game, more carrying the ball, not in Cleveland, and Chig Conquo. Um, but that's not happening for either of them. Chig is averaging 4.5 yards after the catch, and Chig's expected yards after the catch is far 4.5 yards. So he's giving them nothing beyond expected. Separation. Chig, 3.8 yards, but not doing anything with it. NWI and Burks, 2.7 yards of separation. Hopkins, 2.1. And that's about what you would expect. They need longer developing stuff in order to get more open because they need to get further downfield where fewer guys are going to be, right? Guys will be more spaced out the further you get downfield. But they can't get further downfield because Tannehill is under fire. Got to do some video work here. Well, it makes it tough. You know, if, uh, you know, you're having trouble getting quick passes off, then, you know, it makes you have second thoughts about calling your, your long developing stuff and, and getting the ball down the field. So uh, definitely want to do a better job of, of protecting ourselves and, and being able to uh, really expand things and, and get the ball, you know, spread across the field. But in order to do that, you got to have a little bit of time to, uh, to make it happen. So if you're having trouble with your quick stuff, you're really going to have trouble with your long development stuff. I mean, it's common sense. I'm glad he's saying it. But um, they, they don't have good quick stuff. The people who would execute their good quick stuff, I mean, Burks takes time to gather speed. Hopkins doesn't have a lot of speed. NWI doesn't have a lot of speed. Who are you throwing the quick game stuff to and what are they doing with? Well, Spears is your is your best guy for that. Burks, again, takes time to gather speed. Hasn't worked with, with Chig. Henry, it only works, too, after you've kind of established Henry on the run, and then you play action to Henry, and they come to get Henry, and then you throw to him over the guys who came to get Henry. But if he's not running effectively, it's not really there for him. So, um very difficult situation. The new offense, okay? 
Well, some of us had trepidation about Tim Kelly getting the job, but Vrabel, you know, made a convincing argument for why Kelly and Kelly, after he got it, uh, you know, gave some convincing um, bullet points on what would be different about the offense. Um, is it still a Henry based offense? Well, I mean, blocking for him in Cleveland was non-existent. You can't put that on Henry. He's playing 53% of the snaps. Derek Henry's playing 53% of the snaps. That's down 11% from his lowest snap rate since he became the starter. Down 11%. Heavily skewed by the Cleveland game, but still of note. He's responsible for 33.5% of the touches. That's down 5%. So I think it's still a Derrick Henry centered offense, but um, it's hard to know right now. Now they sorted out the Henry Spears thing well in their one win against the Chargers. The Chargers, I believe right now have the 31st ranked defense in the league. So against the terrible defense, the Titans can figure things out offensively against Good defenses, not so much. Um, Zen Sports is the new sponsor of the Paul Kuharski, the new primary sponsor of the Paul Kuharski podcast. And they've got an unbelievable deal. You could read here at the bottom of the screen, sign up at Zen Sports for free membership. Look, if you're not a member of paulkuharski.com, it's never been easier to be a member of paulkuharski.com. You don't have to pay for it. Download the Zen Sports app. Use the code TNPAUL, TNPAUL, make a $10 bet, and boom, you're, you've are you got a free annual membership to paulkuharski.com. Huge, huge value. Let me tell you that again. If you're not a member, you download Zen Sports, you make a $10 bet, use my code TNPAUL, and you get a free membership. If you are a member, download the app, Deposit $250 and they'll match your $250. So all of a sudden you got a ton of money there and get this. However you get into Zen sports, <clears throat> they give you 5% back of what you bet for the first 15 days of, of you being a part of Zen sports. And after that, they give you up to 3% of what you bet monthly. It's like a, a cash back credit card, but, but for your betting. It's a terrific, terrific offer uh, that either gets you in the door for great Titans coverage and analysis, or if you've been here, it gives you a, a great, great match. I know they're early with point spreads there. Uh, the night that Nick Chubb went down, um, you know, I know the, the spread didn't change in the Titans' favor and it didn't turn out to matter, but the, it was the one book that had a, a quick spread up that was adjusted to uh, to – what happened on Monday night football. Um, so I can't encourage you enough to go check it out. It's a great benefit to the membership and it's a great way to become part of the membership Zen sports, go to the app store, get it on your phone, sign up, get on board for the benefits. Um, it's fantastic. Let's get back to what is going on here with the Titans. That was a training camp lie dominant defense. <clears throat> Dominant defense, we've covered this here. Stopping the run does not translate to making opponents one-dimensional, teeing off in the pass rush, forcing bad passing and playing winning defense. It does not. The Titans are 17th overall in defense. That's yardage. Fourth rushing, 28th passing. They're 11th and third down, and they're tied for 16th in points. They've got to erase any thinking that defending the run well translates to winning, to successful overall defense. Get that out of your head. The cornerbacks give up big plays or commit big penalties constantly. They've given up 11 X plays, plays of 20 yards or more, for a total of 347 yards. Brace yourself for this. 36% of the Titans' yards surrendered this year have come on those 11 plays, the 11 X plays. It's ridiculous. They're 10th in sacks per plays, which 
is not a bad place to be. I'd expect them to be higher because their front is so talented. But And they've had some impactful moments, right? Harold Landry had the sack at the end of the regulation of the Chargers game that made the Chargers kick a game-tying field goal. The game-tying field goal puts the Titans in position for a big three and out against the Chargers. They get the ball back. They march down. They kick a field goal. They win the game. Their one win, their best moment. But this defensive front has not been the dominating force that we saw the Browns be centered around Miles Garrett that determined the outcome of a game from start to finish. I mean, they got timely play there against the Chargers, which is great. I'm not taking away from that. But the Browns are the number one defense in football. That's a super impactful defense. Christian Fulton in the back end gave up a perfect passer rating to Deshaun Watson on five targets. Roger McCreary's been really pretty solid. We haven't talked about him at all. When you're not talking about a cornerback, it's because he's playing pretty well. Sean Murphy Bunting, you know, got caught up in a couple penalties in Cleveland. He's an aggressive physical corner who's going to be handsy and needs to maybe gauge his play or uh, uh, adjust his play based on how things are being called. He's given up a touchdown or two, but I think he's been okay. But Fulton's been bad by the eye test, right? Again, I don't want to over-rely on PFF, but just based on my eye test, I went to look at what Fulton scores at PFF as a cross-check. 37.2 coverage. Great. Titan schedule is going to help them, right? That's what we all said all offseason. Second-place schedule, and we did see that come to fruition. The Jaguars lost to Kansas City, a first-place team from last year the same weekend that the Titans beat the Chargers, a second-place team from last year. So that came to fruition. I sold this hard, right? And I don't think the Saints are a very good team. The Titans lost to them. I thought the Chargers are a very good offense, and the Titans beat them. The Browns, I thought, were a so-so team. They got a huge jolt with Jim Schwartz, former Titans assistant, coming in for the last two years, coming in as their new defensive coordinator, and the Titans – got buried by Jim Schwartz's offense and made Deshaun Watson, who's been very, very pedestrian as the Browns quarterback since he got that monstrous guaranteed quarterback. They made him look pretty good. He had his best game in nine games with the Browns. The Titans are not going to beat good defenses playing anything like that playing with the talent that they have and the talent they have isn't going to change. I don't know how much better guys are going to get. Is Christian Fulton going to rediscover the best version of Christian Fulton? I would hope he's better than the Christian Fulton we saw in Cleveland. But I think, you know, last year of his contract, already a hamstring issue. He may be going down a slippery slope. And, uh, and, you know, there, there are other problems. Jack Gibbons you know, has played well, but he's going to get exposed. Uh, Harold Landry is giving it everything he has, but he's not the same guy, and you don't know when uh, that that shade goes all the way up on the ACL recovery. I flipped there uh, to the the defense. On, On the offense, I don't know how you block any, you know, how much better could Andre Dillard be? How much better can the chipping next to him be? I'll give you one way it could be better. Um, You know, they got to figure out the Henry Spears split. Um, The receivers aren't going to get much more separation than they're getting unless they get protection that allows them to go further downfield. And around and around we go. A bright side, one bright side. The Saints are the eighth best defense in the league through three games. The Browns are the number one defense in the NFL through three games. The remaining schedule, as of right now, Atlanta is eighth, Baltimore is 10th, Carolina is 13th, Houston is 16th, Jacksonville is 19th, and the six other teams are all in the 20s. Much more favorable defensive matchups. Now, three games isn't a giant sample size. It doesn't tell us for sure who those defenses are. But as of right now, as of September 27th, 
more favorable. So was camp a lie? Are these things that we took from the summer and, and, uh, and from Minnesota where, where they played pretty well against the team that is now 0-3? Uh, both sides, offense and defense, had good practice stuff, but how much can you judge a team against itself over time? Was it a lie? I bought into too much to expect a, a better start than they've given us. I did. I did well not to buy into a rookie undrafted receiver or an inexperienced receiver, which is an annual event in Nashville, and we fall for one every time. But I'm guilty here. I'm raising my hand with some shame. I talked to Nick Westbrook Akine about this, and he still has a positive spin on camp as a reference point. I'll read to you his quote. I wouldn't say it lied, he said. It's always part of a process. That's how this business is. That's how football is. It's always a process. So we're still working things out. I think if anything, camp showed us who we are. Really, it showed us the truth of who we can be. And now it's on us to live up to that. Well, that's about what I expect the Titans would say. But I think... Effective practices against yourself and against the Vikings in Eden, I think it was, Minnesota, don't show you the truth as, as much as game day does. Game day counts. Game day says you're one and two, and the two tell you you can't score a touchdown over 60 minutes in an NFL game. There's tons of work to be done, and even if the coach better, play better happens, I don't know how much better – some of these elements can play. So uh, there's a lot to worry about. And I'm not saying panic completely because, uh, and I'll have something about, you know, uh, Tim Kelly as compared to, to Arthur Smith coming up too. But there's a lot of reasons to doubt right now. Protection, I wanted to circle back on. Peter Skaronsky's trying to regain some weight. He's got his appetite back, so he's eating better. He's lifting after his appendectomy on September 16th. But the word being used is plural, not singular. Weeks, not weak. So it sounds highly unlikely he's going to play against Cincinnati. Maybe he's back for Indianapolis. Maybe it's not until London uh, against Baltimore. And that's really throwing a wrench into a bad offensive line to be without its best guys. He's got to be back in order for them to consider any changes up front. They just don't have the horses. Mike Herndon has a great piece at paulkuherski.com uh, looking at all the potential lineup changes and variations the Titans could go to once they are healthy. Um, I think that the Titans think that Andre Dillard has actually had some good stretches, that he set too deep in week one, that Miles Garrett was always going to be a problem, a super tough matchup, and that things are going to get better. He's got more time, I think, Andre Dillard. Read Mike's piece for all of the considerations. Blake Battingfield will have uh, his scouting matchup piece on Friday morning to tell you all you need to know about the matchups and the personnel for the upcoming game against the Bengals where Joe Burrow is certainly a concern, but Hendrickson and the pa and Reader and the pass rush look like another scary thing for this offensive line that we're talking about. Showed a big pass rush against the Rams. Now the Rams aren't keeping a lot of people in. The Rams send a lot of people downfield to go catch passes from Matthew Stafford. But the Bengals have the Titans number in the Mike Vrabel era, three games, three losses, including the divisional round heartbreaker to end the 2021 season. Need to tell you about Jasper's, which is still a sponsor here as well. Great restaurant on West End Avenue, kind of between downtown and Midtown. Can't uh, recommend them highly enough. You need to pop in there, have a business lunch or a uh, <clears throat> Great place to do some, some business reading, listen to a podcast, grab some lunch, have a beer, uh, bring the family for a family dinner or, or take your husband or wife 
uh, for a delicious meal. Very varied menu, great food, great drinks, free parking, which is a huge highlight. And uh, if you're the competitive type, you can play some free um, uh, air hockey, um, ski ball, and a variety of other different games. It's a really fun place, fun atmosphere, and uh, I can't recommend them highly enough. I appreciate what's turning into their long-term support. Uh, put it on your list and hit it up. They've got a grab-and-go market if for some reason you can't uh, can't spend uh, 30 or 45 minutes there, you can grab something, take it home and make that work. So Jasper's on West end near downtown and midtown, check them out. Thomas Odakoya is a guy. I think the Titans have to work to get into a game. I mentioned Trevon Wesco's bad blocking earlier. And I think Chig Aconquo has been inconsistent and sometimes wild in his chip help. And this is an area where the Titans can do better. I won't be surprised if Kevin Rader is, is called up to get into the mix. Um, Josh Wiley's played 22 offensive snaps so far, more on special teams. But the guy they need here is Odakoya, who is really good um, in training camp and in the preseason, um, has developed really well, was a freebie for them last year. They didn't even find him. They were assigned him as an international uh, player. So he's on the practice squad now as an international exemption. So he's their 17th practice squad guy, and they can't call him up. They have to put him on the regular practice squad, and he's got to be there for three weeks before he's eligible to be called up or to be signed to the 53-man roster. I think they've got to make that move and get that clock ticking because there aren't many spots where the Tennessee Titans have a potential improvement around, and this is one. Mike Vrabel said it's something they could look at, something that could be a possibility. And I I think, you know, on a team that's had shown some significant weaknesses at a spot where there's an actual improvement available to you, if you have to set a timer on that, you better set the timer on that and and get it going. So Thomas Otakoya, I think we should be seeing him in four weeks or five weeks. Uh, And to me, it's it's not soon enough for the kind of help they need. Reminder about Zen Sports. Uh, Listen, go get the app. If you're not a member of the site, you get the Zen Sports app. You use the code TNPAUL. As you sign up, you make a $10 bet. You get a free membership to paulkuharski.com, which costs you $5.99 a month. You get a year of that for free. They're buying and if you are a member, you go get the app, sign up, TN Paul as your code. You deposit 250, they give you 250. You got a betting bankroll. It should, I don't know, maybe you're maybe, maybe more high stakes than I am. That would take me well into uh, the beyond the NFL season and college football season, but have at it, do whatever you like. And for the first 15 days of betting, no matter how you get in, you get 5% back in cash of what you've bet. And then after that, 3% back every month, up to 3% back every month um, of what you bet. It's a great deal, great company, happy to be partnered with Zen Sports. Please check them out. In the meantime, I urge you to lock your locks. Uh, No, I botched that. How about that? Don't block the box. See, I'm so excited about Zen Sports, I forgot my my sign-off. Don't block the box, but be sure to lock your locks.